Hi everyone, um, my name is Sebastian Leisen and together with my colleague David de Wilde, I will be presenting the projects that we have been working on at EFSA over the past uh, year, where we have been in, a, in essence laying the foundation of an intelligent event-driven data platform. Both David and myself, we are working at Delaware, which is an IT consultant organization uh, with firm roots in Belgium, but with a growing global presence as well, as you can see here on the right of the, of the screen. Uh, on this project, I took on the role of data platform lead, while David took on the role of technical solution architect. And David will be taking up the second part, which will be the deep dive into the, the data big solution. Now, I think the, uh, just for the overview, um, the key objective, I think, of this presentation is to share with you our perspective and uh, lessons learned on how to install and use Databricks. It's a very powerful platform that we uh, hey, we can all agree, I think, on that. It, it, it covers a lot of analytical and data science use cases. But of course, you have to make upfront good architectural decisions uh, on how to organize your storage, how to organize your flows. And we just want to share with you our insights and best practices that we gathered from our um, process over the past year at EFSA. Before we do that, I will first be giving you an overview on uh, who EFSA is and give you a bit of an overview on the context of the project. EFSA is the European Food Safety Authority. So it's the European agency that is responsible for providing independent scientific advice on everything related to the food and feed safety in Europe. Of course, they work together with a lot of other national authorities and stakeholders. But if you would need to summarize uh, EFSA in a nutshell, it's they are basically um, responsible for making sure that everything that the European citizens are eating is uh, considered safe. Um, now, to understand the role or the position of EFSA um, in this, in this uh, process, you have to understand the distinction between what we call risk assessment on the one hand versus risk management on the other hand. Risk assessment is the role that EFSA is doing for everything related to the food and feed chain. So it's doing independent scientific advice. And of course, for that, they need to collect and analyze a lot of research data. On the other hand, you have the risk management, as you can see on the right, which um, is typically done by the European Commission, European Parliament, and, and other stakeholders. But they are responsible for making policy and making informed decisions. And in this case, they are doing that for everything related to food and feed safety um, with the information that EFSA is consolidating and providing to them. Now, I will be in the next few slides giving you an overview on the core risk assessment process uh, at EFSA, because I think it's important for understanding the, the context of the project. So there are three main steps. The first step is the receipt of the request, which um, as you can see on the left, you have the, the, the three typical European bodies and they mandate EFSA to work on a particular risk assessment. So they are basically saying you can free up time and resources to work on a particular scientific advice. So the mandate is coming in, and then you have to know that within EFSA, um, EFSA is organized around 10 panels of uh, external scientific experts, independent experts, and each of these panels is dedicated to a particular area within the uh, food and feed chain. And uh, of course, to each panel, we have also uh, related working groups of people who are doing the actual work, but it's the panels who are overviewing the overall process. So when a mandate is coming in, let's say it is in this case assigned to the food contact materials panel. So that's the first part, the receival of the request. Second part in the process is the actual risk assessment itself. And as you can see here, a lot of data is used to perform such an assessment. So you have the scientific evidence, which is typically coming in uh, via um, dossiers that applicants have big organizations that um, they submit to EFSA. And it contains a lot of documents and information describing those documents. Of course, you have the expertise of the experts themselves. You have the literature studies but also the public opinion. Yes, so sometimes EFSA launches public consultations to ask feedback, feedback from the public. So all that information is used to eventually come up with the scientific advice for a particular topic. And that's what you can see on the right. So uh, the outcome of a risk assessment is called the opinion or also the output of, often called the output or opinion. And initially it's in draft, uh, but there are a lot of meetings and, and feedback rounds. And eventually when the output is final and the advice is, is concluded, uh, then the output is adopted by the panel. In this case, the food contact materials. Now, um, 
The third part, the last part in the step is adoption or publishing of the output. So the opinion is shared back to the original uh, requesters, uh, in this case, uh, the European Commission or European Parliament, for example, um, so that they can make legislation changes and make informed decisions based on the out outcome of the risk assessment. And in parallel, the opinions are also published in the EFSA journal, which is a pre free public website, which is hosting all the scientific papers that EFSA is uh, publishing. So that's the nutshell of what is EFSA, what EFSA is doing in essence. Now, you have to know that in 2019, an interesting opportunity, as I can say, uh, came by. Uh, the European Parliament voted in 2019 that uh, they voted a regulation which is basically imposing EFSA to become much more transparent. Um, so uh, as part of the regulation, there were objectives for EFSA to comply with. In essence, they were demanding that um, you and I have a better view on what is happening to come to the to come to the outputs of the opinions. So, what are the pieces of data that, that are being used? Um, how is the decision process um, happening to come to the opinion? What meetings were taking place, etc. So, all the pieces to, that jointly constitute the, the the opinion that is um, published by EFSA. How did it come to to place? Um, and EFSA basically took it as an opportunity to review their internal processes as well as their uh, IT landscape um, to embark on a bigger um, um, digital transformation to uh, comply with the, uh, the, the points that were in the, the regulation. And that's of course also where Delaware came in to uh, support um, EFSA as a partner in this uh, journey. Then I come to the second part of the presentation, which is the high level solution architecture. So to help EFSA comply, we, you can say that we worked on three main pillars. The first pillar is uh, the data platform. So it's a modern data platform, which is in essence, collecting and consolidating all pieces of data that, is sur that are surrounding the risk assessment, both structured and unstructured data, big data volumes, small data sets. Um, so we have been thinking and designing and implementing with them a modern data platform to host all that information. Secondly, the integration pillar, which is enabling all the applications within EFSA, which are taking up a part of the whole process for the risk assessment to communicate to each other in real time using what we call the event-driven architecture uh, paradigm. So it is uh, installing a central event broker, which is um, routing the information between the events following a publisher subscribe mechanism. And then thirdly, we have the open EFSA portal, which is a public website which is in essence informing the public on everything related to the risk assessment. So where we are in the life cycle, what pieces of data were being used, what experts did what, etc. So it is it recently uh, went live and is making available an enormous amount of data to the public. And in essence, it's enabling greater security of EFSA's work. Now, the best way for me to explain what we have been doing is by comparing it to what is happening on the airport. And what you can see here is a control tower. And uh, if I think on a control tower on the airport, it is taking up several activities like uh, enabling the communication between airplanes, orchestrating the ground processes, validating the flight plans, monitoring all types of things, tracking the airplane movements in real time, scheduling arrivals and departures, etc. Um, now, if I think on a data platform and I compare it with what is happening on the airport, this is how I would think of it. So the data platform is responsible for brokering information between applications, ideally in real time, orchestrating data of movements, but also validating data, as well as monitoring the health of the platform and, and the data flows, harmonizing and consolidating the data, as I said before, and also feeding the data to other parties, other applications, both internally and potentially also externally. So building a bit further on that analogy, if you think on the applications that are uh, part of the whole risk assessment process in EFSA as being the planes that are flying around in the air surrounding the control tower, the information that they share um, is basically brokered by the control tower. And that's the first part, the real-time event-driven communication. But secondly, all that communication, we route or we channel that information into a central knowledge base, a central data store, which is curating the data, harmonizing the data, and making sure that it can be easily be fed to other applications. Now, if we translate it into the, uh, the EFSA use case, this is the, the picture that we end up high level. So on the top, you can see the event-driven architecture and the main applications that are um, a subset of the applications, I should say, that are involved in uh, EFSA's risk assessment process. 
And so what is happening at the top is that um, they are sharing events in real time whenever something happens. So let's say a mandate is coming in, then the mandate is registered in Salesforce, an event is triggered, and other parties or systems are involved automatically, or in, they are informed automatically. And so all those events, they are also channeled, as I said, into a central data store, which is running on Azure. And all the transformations that are taking place on that data store are um, enabled by Databricks together with Delta Lake. And all the information and the truth that we are building there as a central source of truth is then feeding into a variety of consumption use cases, as I call, of which you can see a subset here below. So for example, the Open EFSA portal, which is a public website, but also an API portal, which I will come to in a second, as well as, for example, an internal dossier viewer application, and of course, EFSA's management reporting so that uh, they also are aware high level of what is going on. Now, uh, the next two slides give you an example of, what we have, of the deliverables that we have been building. So this is an example of the Open EFSA portal. Um, and you can also find the link below here in the slide if you want to navigate to it yourself. And actually, everything that you see on this website is generated by the platform and kept in sync automatically based on the events and the data we get from the other systems. So let's say that um, an, the output is, or the opinion is adopted, and that's an event that is triggered from Appian, which is the application managing the life cycle of a risk assessment. The event is forwarded to, uh, to Azure, and it is automatically propagated to the Open EFSA portal, uh, and it will update the timeline in this case, as you can see. Uh, so that's one example. So everything, as I said, is uh, updated by uh, the data flow underneath, and also what we call the dissemination rules, which is the rules determining when information should be publicly disclosed are all implemented using that same framework. Secondly, as uh, what I included here is a screenshot of our API developer portal, which is enabling uh, EFSA to give the, the uh, other developers um, access to the risk assessment information. So what you see here is an API, a RESTful API called Get Mandates, which enables EFSA to uh, or which enables um, other developers to retrieve the data in the Azure Data Store. So it's basically a data as a service uh, philosophy in which, uh, of course, it's, uh, the APIs are secured, but once as a developer you are given access, you can use the data in your own application. Then if we zoom in a bit uh, deeper into uh, the technical components to make it all work, basically um, this image summarizes the generic, generic pattern that we installed. So on the top, you can see the equivalent or the machinery, if I may say, of the control tower, whereas below you can see uh, the implementation and the components that we used for uh, implementing the central data store. So um, as can be seen, it's running on a data lake storage Gen 2, uh, and all the transformations are done as by Databricks, uh, which we will uh, discuss later on. But so let's take an example. Let's say, let's say um, the, that a mandate is coming in, which is registered in Salesforce. So then on the left top, you have the application uh, component in this diagram. Let's say it's Salesforce. The mandate is created. They will publish an event mandate created using uh, the endpoint that is registered in API management. The event is triggered to Azure. And then it walks through a series of um, components to uh, validate uh, certain things like the header of the event, the payload, as well as uh, making sure that the event is routed to the proper subscribers. Right? That's the publish subscribe mechanism. So that other systems are automatically updated in real time when something happens. In the same time, or in, in addition, we also queue all the events in an event hub. And then using small micro or mini batches every, let's say, 50 minutes to an hour, depending on the load, we clear a new batch of events and we process the data using Databricks and Delta Lake technology in order to store the data in uh, the, what we call canonical data model, as well as in the views, which will eventually also feed into the data marts as we see on the right, uh, to feed into the various consumption use cases that are at play. So the open EFSA portal, but also the, uh, the other use cases like the developer portal or the EFSAS uh, management reporting. So that's a bit in a nutshell, the overall machinery. Now, one final part that I want to uh, emphasize is how you organize yourself. So as you can see at the bottom, we have a series of zones which are colored in different colors. Databricks typically refers to this as raw silver, uh, bronze, silver, and gold. Um, the uh, analogy that we um, came up with is, of course, the first zone, which is raw, which is storing the data as it, we get it from, in the native format as we get it from uh, the source system. 
The second zone is what we call the curated zone, which is storing the data in a clean, validated, standardized format. And we can say that curated data, we have high confidence in it. But these first two zones, they are organized similarly. So they're organized around the systems which give you the data, so the source systems. While the final two zones, they're organized around the information. So the third zone is what we call the canonical data model or the reference data model, if you want, which is a shelf of reusable pieces of information. Think of it as a data warehouse uh, in which you have uh, pieces of data that you can reuse to analyze and come up with new views, which is the final layer. Uh, so the views is what we call data that is ready to be consumed by other systems or applications. So it is optimized for reading. And we adhere to the principle of storing the views typically at least once in um, the data lake using Delta Lake if it's structured information, but um, also uh, keeping the data in sync to one or more data marts depending on the use case at hand. So for example, for the Open EFSA portal, that application is powered by an Azure SQL database, which is also um, storing the same views as we have on the data lake. And I think overall, this architecture is um, is, is one architecture that is capable of dealing with both big and small data volumes, both structured and unstructured data, which I think is a very powerful um, way of working with data. Um, and that summarizes a bit uh, my part. So I'm happy now to give over the floor to my uh, colleague, David, who will take up the second part of this presentation. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. So for the second part, I will go a little bit deeper in the technical implementation. So to start, I will go to the technical challenges. So our first challenge was that we have a lot of tables. So we have 350 tables, which is rather complicated to keep organized. On the other hand, we still want to have quick reload times. And of course, cost efficiency is always an important factor. Next to that, it's uh, important to keep a consistent way of working, although that you have a changing team with people starting with different experience levels. Um, you want to keep everything organized, so a central logging of your data pipelines, data governance and data cataloging is important. And the housekeeping of 350 tables can get really time consuming, so we also want to put a focus on that. Um, all of us are working on uh, putting your data structured in a data lake house, and uh, we don't want to get the data swamp, so we want to keep everything structured. So to achieve that, it's also important to get your data pipelines organized and structured. And to achieve that goal, we uh, came up with the framework. So it's important to think, how do we structure everything? Um, so our framework, the main assumption is that we want to split the business logic, which is the valuable part, as much from all other uh, activities. So we want to cut off all non-value adding activities from the core, which is business logic. Um, and we work with the data frame as a central concept. Uh, and you will see that some of the other sessions, um, they will start from a data pipeline. Both possibilities are OK, but we start from a data frame. Um, and then the non-value adding activities can be logging, housekeeping, optimization of your tables, and everything else. Um, how did we implement this? We started from an object-oriented framework. So our framework consists of two class definitions. On the one hand, we have the data lake table that extends the data frame. So a data lake table consists of a data frame together with some configuration properties and source information. And next to that, we have a second class, the data lake class, which um, groups a group of data lake table objects and also consists of the directed assembly graph, so the lineage between the data lake tables and orchestration functionality. So here we split the class definitions, which is a framework, from the actual content, which are the data lake tables. So developers only need to implement the data frame and the extra configuration properties. And the class definitions can be copied between projects and between uh, clients. If you then have a look how we work with this in practice, you can see that we work in the online environment of Databricks. So we start with some parameters on the top of the notebook. Next to that, we have some transformations, as you can see in the second cell. Um, here, it's very simple because it's just an example. But in real life, we have more transformations, of course. And then the whole framework is metadata driven. And you can see that we have some metadata regarding the orchestration, some regarding how we want to export data, 
and some regarding how to catalog the data. If we now focus in a little bit more on the non-value adding activities, so these are things that you need to do, but it's not adding direct value. An important part is your CI-CD pipelines. We can see that for build phase, it's rather uh, simple. We just loop over our notebooks, we create data lake tables from it, and then we group the data lake tables in a single data lake object. Uh, and we can just store that uh, data lake object to disk by calling the data lake not safe method. Um, the deployment phase is an even simpler because we just copy the file to our next environment. And with the data lake dot load uh, uh, method, we load the data lake and then we can run data lake dot initialize to create all delta tables that are not existing in that environment and the existing ones we can update. Uh, which will add columns if they if needed or alter the properties. Loading data is also just calling data lake.run to load new data in the data lake. And with data lake.export, we can export data to different uh, systems. Uh, the housekeeping is also rather simple. We can just use data lake.optimize to optimize all delta tables, keeping the Z order columns. Um, and we have helper notebooks to visualize the DAG representation or to, for example, export the data catalog. Then to really orchestrate our process, we make use of the directed acyclic graph principle, as probably many of you know from um, Airflow. Um, for the EFSA project, this is really key, so I will go a little bit deeper in this. Um, we have 350 tables, but still we want to reload as much as possible. So it's not efficient to reload 350 tables every time again, especially since we only expect a small amount of tables mm. to get new events per batch. So what we do, we first look at which source tables got new events. In this case, it's our tables two and four. And then we only select the descendants from those tables and that are the tables that need to be reloaded. So for example, table five, nothing has changed on table one. So we don't need to reload table five. We can skip a lot of tables. And this makes that we only need to load a limited amount of tables. If we go back to the example from uh, Sebastian, so a new mandate has got created. In that case, we only need to load 40 tables instead of the full list of 350 tables. Of course, this makes that we can run, we can run everything much more efficiently, as you can see here. Then I want to focus a little bit on how we export data, mainly to show you how we implemented our framework as an example. Um, so we export data to different file formats and different databases. We can export to a SQL database to the Spark file formats. But since we're working in Python, we can also use Python libraries. And for example, we created a custom function to export to PDF files via Wheezyprint. But we can also export data over REST API calls. And everything is implemented in the framework in the data lake table class. So we only need to implement it once and we can copy it between projects and clients. And then we can just use it by adding a few metadata properties. So on the bottom right, you can see that it's really just a few lines of metadata to export this data frame both to a PDF file and to an API call. Then how did we implement this and why it's so important? So it's important that it's implemented in the class definition so that we have one version of the code and only one place that we need to maintain and we reuse it everywhere. So this makes it easier to do code improvements for example, we recently changed from a normal GDBC export to a bulk GDBC. We only needed to change this code in one place and we didn't need to update 350 data pipelines. Similarly, we switched from PyODBC for executing stored procedures on SQL to the Spark built-in GDBC driver, which is a very interesting case. A colleague of mine has written a nice blog post regarding this. You can find the link on the bottom of this slide. Um, and of course, since we only have one version of the code, it's also easier to add extra functionality. Recently, you also added table switching when we are overwriting a table in SQL. So those are things that are easy to do and your future proof because you can do changes in one place 
and everything gets updated automatically. Um, and how we actually implemented this is, as you can see on the right, um, we have a lot of uh, templated code, PySpark code and SQL comments. And on the right places, we just fill in the metadata provided by um, the developer. So if we then have a second look at our technical challenges and how we solved everything, we can see because of the dark based loading of the subtree, we can efficiently and quickly reload 350 tables. Everything runs on a single job cluster for cost efficiency reasons. And because our, with our assumption, we put a structure in our data pipelines and only a bare minimum of coding is needed because only the ATL code is needed. It makes it easier for new people to start. And we also enforce a consistent way of working. Um, both the logging of the data pipelines and the data governance is all dealt with by the framework. And doing the housekeeping boils down to just running a single function call instead of writing a whole lot of pipelines. Um, so we can conclude that in this project, we have uh, enriched the event-driven architecture with a central data store to add more functionality for the customer. Next to that, it's very important that you don't lose the control over your data pipelines. And you can do this by organizing your data flows in a structured way. And lastly, it's important to be lazy and reuse as much of your code as possible. And we did this by splitting our logic as much as possible from our housekeeping activities. Um, so finally, I want to thank EFSA for putting their trust in us, Delaware, to help them realize this innovative digital transformation project. And I want to stress that both Sebastian and I are present in the chat and it, that we will do our best to answer any questions that you have. And we also want to encourage you to start a discussion. Thank you for your attention and have fun with the other sessions.